Welcome to BulletCast, the Bullet Catcher Gaming Podcast. In this episode, we will be talking about Ghost Recon, Breakpoint, Slash Wildlands, and Mill Sims. The guests for this episode we have today are JTF21 with Prime, Sam, Kyrick, and White Death. With Task Force Red Arrow, we have Mad Dog and Darkseid. With the 248th and 37th NSWG, we have Defect. And Task Force 104, we have Delta and myself. I am your voice host, Marcus. And now, Andy from Bullet Catcher Gaming. Thank you, Marcus. Do appreciate it. This one's been a bit more complicated to put together, but... I just want to say a huge thank you for everyone from multiple different meal sims um, for taking part and a big thank you to JTF for having me on their Discord um, and helping me with some stuff recently. I do really appreciate it. Um, the reason why we wanted to do this is because it's, it's not re it is a topic of conversation, but it's a different type of topic than what we would normally cover. And since we've kind of this channel's been up and running for over two years now it's something that comes up over and over again and when we're looking at the future of the franchise and and even the games that the past games such a massive part of it is mil sim or we you know we break it down into kind of mil sim kind of hardcore players and then you're just kind of average run of the mill type of player um but mill sims are a huge part of this community. They drive the, you know, they drive it. A lot of people may have given up playing Breakpoint when the last update was done, but the mill sims will keep on going. And I think it's very important going forward that Ubisoft listen to what mill sims want. Um, so we just thought it'd be really interesting to have a podcast about mill sims. And I think we'll start with a really basic, basic, generic question, because there may be some people that are going to listen to this who actually go, I'm not really sure. I've heard of Mill Sims, but I don't really know what they are. Would somebody like to explain just really quickly before we get going, just to some of the people who are not sure what a Mill Sim is primarily? Whoever would like to jump in, just jump in and just give us a quick explanation. I can go ahead and do that. So, Milsim is the use, organization, and implementation of military tactics within a gaming environment, um, either used to simulate a specific unit type or function, or to just simulate military tactics in general in the form of like a tax sim, for example. But it basically stands for military simulation. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hopefully, everyone agrees with that. Um, so let's get going then. So I want to first of all find out what is the appeal of Milsim. And I think we'll kind of turn it into a double party question. What's the appeal of Milsim? And what is the best type of game for Milsim? Is it open world like Breakpoint, Wildlands, for example? Or do some of the Milsim guys kind of wish in a way that the next game might be more linear um would they prefer that i mean i'm presuming it's going to be open world because of the freedom it gives you but let's start with something really easy just like that let's get going um and you know what what is it about the games that makes milsim so interesting Um, if you guys don't mind uh, having me jump in. Uh, so for me, one of the things about Milsim, especially for the appeal, is the uh, camaraderie, it's the uh, companionship, it's the being able to work together as a unit and be a part of something uh, in a more strategic way than you typically would ever feel when you're just either playing with AI or even just pay playing your different uh, multiple Call of Duty style campaign missions. One of the things that... Uh, which really makes a Milsim thrive, especially if you look at gaming wise, uh, you know, a lot of people, especially on the PC end, will point directly to Arma. Uh, the ability it gives you to create your own scenarios, be able to execute them, have different things happening, and have AI take over both land, air, and sea, uh, not only uh, 
infantry movement, but uh, vehicle as well. Being able to constantly create something adds to the replayability, and it also adds to the uh, immersion that you could give uh, a lot of the people that you have in these units. Unfortunately, Arma, because of how it's designed, uh, it's not very a very console-friendly game. But with Breakpoint or with Wildlands, especially what Ghost Recon has did, have managed to give you give us enough for us to be able to have it be a console thing, but be able to give us enough for us to be able to use it in a milsome sense as well. Um, for the future uh, going through with Ghost Recon, I still believe in multi-console gaming. I do believe in PC. I do believe in uh, consoles, you know, PlayStation, Xbox, whatever you play. So there needs to be this more open um, and then you know, being able to create your own scenarios, being able to create uh, whatever kind of experiences you want that you get with Arma, but being able to be mindful of uh, how much you can actually put into this game before the console start to suffer. Um, you know, you look at some of the more heavily modded uh, units in Arma, and people with more lower end PC just struggle with performance. So this is something that. You, it's like the Pandora's box. You don't want to get too much into all of that because then now you're starting to alienate people, again, like the consoles or the more lower-end PC guys. And I don't think break. I don't think Ghost Recon was really meant for just one specific group. I think the, the one thing I loved about Ghost Recon is that everyone really gets to experience it. So being able to give us this more open-ended uh, pool while still being being able to fit a parameter that these consoles or lower end PC players can still work with and still have a very fun time with as well. Uh, Cause I can't tell you how many times when I would see, well, play games, you know, more linear style games. And the problem is, is that you don't get that sense of replayability afterwards. And you eventually just figure out what's the best way to beat it when within, you know, who you are as a player and then that's it, you're done. But with the more open-ended or open world and being able to create a more a custom mission will give more infinite uh, replayability, which is why a lot of these milsims are still around, whether it's Wildlands or Breakpoint, when the casual audience has picked up and moved on. I think that that's something that Ubisoft has to really understand is long-term, uh, when the more dedicated people are still around, what can they do to cater to that unit so that that unit can, or those groups of players could still constantly be kicking and having a good time with as well? Okay, that was a really good explanation. Um, anyone else want to uh, jump in on that from some of the other uh, mill sims? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll go ahead. Uh, I completely agree with him, mainly kind of how I got into this whole Ghost Recon Milsim thing, is it was like, I'm watching YouTubers that, like, play these games like Arma, like Squad, like Tarkov, but obviously it's on PC. And then, you know, being a console player, I'm like, well, what's the closest I could get to that? And then, you know, I kind of just found the Ghost Recon thing. Um, and I, I do agree with what Defect was saying as, you know, it's not too crazy there's not too many mods to it's not too expansive to the point where it's like you're running at 10 frames per second while you're on you know your console uh at the same time i also agree with what he's saying with regards to you know ma the majority of the long-term players on the milsim scene at least on ghost recon are mainly the people who are playing it consistently through thick and thin uh, and just toughen it out because currently as it sits on console it's pretty much the best experience that we could get all in all. Um, as for linear open world, I feel like the open world definitely allows more creativity with, you know, like what you plan on doing, like you could, you know, do like a presence patrol down uh, an MSR, uh, like a road, or you can run up and go, like, you know, work with rebels, do some ANA stuff, or you could, like, it just allows you to do like a larger breadth of everything, 
And then with that, it allows you to replay and maybe attack bases for a different thing or set up your own mission that has a, a an objective uh, on the same base, but like say like you hit it later, like it, it just allows you to reuse the map over and over again and not get like drained out like oh I'm doing the same mission that the game has. It, it allows you to like not have that feeling. Um, but yeah, I'd say pretty much open world and the fact that it's like the best experience you could get on console for overall replayability, enjoyment, implementation of real world tactics and stuff is is probably at least the appeal that I could see to it. So, yeah. No, thanks. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that one? I, I think to add a little bit more into the appeal factor, um, Mil Milsim kind of just has this X factor when it comes to the community, the support, um, and the amount of camaraderie that we have. Um, what what got me into it mostly was the fact that I, I use facets of it in my profession. Um, and so it gave me a skill set that I wanted to explore further, but may or may not have had the opportunities to do so consistently. Um, and so what Milsim kind of provides for people is the ability to have organized, precise, um, cohesive gameplay that everybody's working together, everybody's communicating well, um, and it just creates kind of like this well-oiled machine, which is what a lot of people want to see in gaming. You don't want to be playing with randoms all the time. You don't want to be having to deal with the craziness that goes with um, playing with people that you don't know. And so being a part of like some, something that has a purpose and a direction um, get, you know, is, is very easy to get people on board for. Um, and then the actual tactics portion of it, it's very easy to go learn these things. They're, they're very founded. Um, and a lot of them have a lot of real world direct connections that you can actually utilize. Um, so it just creates this environment where people are just driven towards it. Um, and then once you're in it, you, you never stop learning. Like it's always something that you can pick up and do differently. Um, in terms of the platforms that it moves into and the directions that gaming needs to go in, I feel like a lot of what Defect and Prime said, um, kind of that open-ended format, um, kind of progress it forward, but main, start implementing as much realism as capable. Like, go back and actually look at, do these shooting mechanics actually work? Are the implementations that you're putting into it actually have a purpose so that when the people who do know what they're doing are in it, we can actually utilize that as a tool. We can actually bring it forth and use it to teach something or use it to actually bring in that realism and that immersion. Um, and then for the people who are not trained very well or you know don't want to get that serious within it, it still gives them something to to feel like they can be a part of something that they may or may not you know be in because everybody loves being like this high speed delta operative running through the the dark bravo six going dark kind of shit because it's it's really appealing like movies make it look so appealing to people um that it's it's definitely a good community to get into if if anybody's interested in that kind of stuff no, I think you made some really good points there. So I, I want to come back to one point that you were just mentioning, and I mean, because I'm intrigued about this, and if anyone's got the answer. So you were talking about obviously cohesive teamwork. Obviously, it can be very frustrating if you enjoy playing a particular way. And I always remember at the the very beginning of Wildlands, probably in the first week or so, and I hadn't changed my settings over, and I had some random people come into the game. And I remember flying over, saw one of the new guys who jumped in down on the ground, flew down to go and pick him up, and he blew me out of the sky with his grenade launcher and thought it was hilarious. And it's like, yeah, that's not really what I was after. Like, you know, and people would go off, they'd do their own thing, they'd mess about, they wouldn't do what you wanted to do. When was Milsim kind of born? Like, especially for in Ghost Recon, because I don't know at all about this. So, was was the Milsim community for Ghost Recon born through Wildlands, or did it exist before with the previous titles? Um, 
I'm really intrigued because obviously they were more more linear titles, certain open worldness to, to a part, but not a proper what we would call open world game. Um, anyone know when when that started, and 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 was it is that why is that why because of those reasons you know those type of things that I just mentioned is that why meal sims were created in the first place so people could go and play the same way in in that kind of tactical cohesiveness. I'm not sure exactly when in game, and I'm going off of my own experience, but there have been outside of video um but in real life you know you have the paintball you have the um paint uh, the pellet ball games so milsim has been around probably ever since the military has been around so you've always had the cops and robbers type game which is a very milsimy type even though you you did that with your fingers as a kid so the weapons have changed nowadays to paintball um, I can't think of the actual um, airsoft type gaming. So Milsim has been around, I believe now, and you can even really see Milsim has really picked up in those two areas with the authentic type weaponry that they use now. So I agree because paintball's kind of been killed off by airsoft, and airsoft has probably become hugely popular because of call of duty ghost recon things like that and i'm sure milsim groups and things like that it's definitely um don't really know anyone who plays paintball anymore everyone plays airsoft because of the realism factor but um uh, price actually too paintball skyrocketed in price yeah that probably airsoft didn't help is, airsoft is like dirt cheap compared to paintball true apart from the gear i, I mean i mean i'm an airsoft i think my last rifle cost me 850 pound 900 pound i think by the time i'd finished with it which was quite a lot of money it was you know but you know you don't have to you don't have to pay that kind of money yeah. but um yeah so, so when it comes to pc um, i know arma has been around for quite some time when it comes to consoles i know a lot of you might be surprised of uh, me hearing this but i actually been doing milsim back in battlefield 4 um, we would have people buy out servers and we would have like these actual like groups and units and then we just had like a few dedicated people to just be the um, enemy and kind of simulate them and we would just have engagement distances a lot farther, more realistically farther than what you generally would have in your basic Battlefield Call of Duty style gameplay. Um, and it worked very well uh, and, and then of course when Ghost Recon came around uh, I do know that a lot of us, including myself, kind of moved over to that because at the end of the day, no one wants to be the bad guy in a sense. Uh, so we all moved over and I think that's what happened. I think it, you could actually even go even further back. Um, and I'm not going to reference any particular number on this one, but just thinking of the SOCOM days and especially with the large maps on SOCOM 3 and Combined Assault. Those large maps, you could have a quite of a bit of a milsim setting, especially if you can communicate with the other side of the teams. So that That's was a challenge. So I, I yeah. remember having I remember having clans and things like that. So I used to have a clan for Rainbow Six Vegas, but I, I don't remember there being a milsim community for games like Rainbow Six Vegas. If you know what I mean. If uh, if you Operation could... Firepoint was a big one too. Uh, that was actually the one of the first games I had to grind my teeth on proper uh, ballistics, you know, bullet yeah, but it, uh, stuff like that. But it was naturally just a game where you can get a bunch of guys together, whether they're mil military, um, e uh, um, emergency services, or even just a civilian to even play. It got you together in a like-minded setting, like we are currently in Ghost Recon. It gives you that simulated feel. Yeah. So uh, the co the concept of like military simulators and tactical shooters and all that have have progressed since like the PlayStation Two days. Like U.S. Stalcom, you know, uh, Stalcom U.S. Navy SEALs and like all those other like really cool military based games. I think kind of built the basis for for what these games are all built off of. Um, and so when you start looking at um, Rainbow Six uh, Vegas and Battlefield 4, like some of those have been pioneers within the community because they allowed for 
community to build. They allowed for people to be in games at one time. Um, I would say that the predominant amount of the people that I've um, been with or represented within the community um, are all from, you know, Battlefield 4 or some kind of PC because that was kind of one of the only platforms back in the day that allowed people to get multiple individuals on at one time to coordinate as a team in an open-ended format that allowed them to run operations. Um, and so from, from the success of that, it transitioned into uh, Wildlands because that was kind of a much more precise, a much cleaner variation of it um, and kind of modernized where Milsim went from that point. Um, and, and kind of in between that, uh, sewn through the fabrics, has been GTA, surprisingly enough. Um, Grand Theft Auto, with a lot of its updates and a lot of the stuff that's come in, um, has actually had a large following of Milsim-like military simulator-type units spawn up out of nowhere. Um, and I would have to say those are the two predominant locations that um, I've met most of the people who have come into this community uh, since since it kind of spawned itself in um, to the you know in in full force in the Ghost Recon environment back in the beginning year or so of Wildlands, um, and then from there everybody's kind of had this basis of of one of the two games moving throughout this community, um, and it's just progressively built as we've moved from game to game. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, let's try and get. Um... So a few people that haven't really spoke yet. So Mad Dog and, and White Death and Delta. I, I want to get your opinions here. So what makes Ghost Recon, whether it be Wildlands or Breakpoint, because those are the two we're going to probably primarily focus on, what makes those two games um, ideal for Milsim? What, what is it about those games? We've discussed open world. What else is in there that makes it ideal? Well, we got no one. I got yeah. jump in. Go for it. Uh, so, I would say there's a lot of good aspects with like customization. Obviously, um, outfits. You know, instead of solely running around with one outfit that's locked to a specific class. You know, if I'm in an urban environment, and say I'm mill simming a, a Delta team. I can be an urban kid with blue jeans and a plaid shirt and baseball cap backwards, just like the movies. Or if I'm simulating a naval special warfare group or SEAL team, I can go in and I could be wearing a full-on kit, um, different color camouflages for the different types of environments. And not just that, but the the amount of weapons that each of the games kind of give us um you know m4s different platforms uh from ar-15 style weaponry uh different sniper rifles i would say too another big big thing that uh really separates the milson community and one of the reasons why i've always loved it is you know we get into these games and instead of playing with you know three other randoms that oh hey I want to be the sniper. No, I want to be the sniper. No, I, I want to be the sniper. I'm the best. You're not arguing. You guys, you know, four guys get into a, a map or a game and you sit there and say, okay, you have a job, you have a job, you have a job, I have a job. We all know our jobs. We all have our specific gear laid out. We all have our weapon systems laid out the way we know how to use them, the way that, you know, we're comfortable with. Um, I think that really brings a substantial fun factor to it at least in, in my world it does fair enough anyone else want to jump in on that white death or delta or yeah and then i guess kind of add on to that definitely um just having the variety of of weapons that you can use that ghost recon has always had because i mean i remember kind of the first ghost recon you had I mean, you had all these specialists, you had like riflemen, you had a sniper, um, kind of stuff like that. And then it kind of evolved uh, to kind of where it is today that, I mean, we have, you know, a variety of instruments of death to play with from like DMRs to shotguns, SMGs, 
um, machine guns, vehicles now. So definitely Wildlands and Breakpoint have been really good kind of adding um, really the customization of different kind of weapons. And honestly, really kind of another aspect is just the customization of, of characters that we can have now. Because, um, again, kind of going back to the original Ghost Recon, it was, I mean, you were always, like, a fifth SFG guy. And, I mean, of course, that is kind of the lore with Ghost Recon, but I feel kind of where these new games have really kind of excelled is, you know, we can be, you know, JTF2. You know, we can be a Polish Grom guy. We can be SAS. I mean, so it really kind of opened everything up and kind of, allowed people to kind of create their own environment to, you know, kind of enjoy. So I, I definitely the past few games for all their faults have been, you know, really good at that aspect. No, that's a really I can, good. I like it. I can, I can piggyback off of what they were saying. I think the uh, one thing in my opinion, what I like about Ghost Recon is kind of like they just said already. The uniform aspects, you can create like multiple different units, Marsocks, Rangers, you know, just all of it because of that. You can even create like Russian Spetsnaz groups and stuff because of the uniform customizations and the camos that they got. I think that's one of the one things that most people enjoy about it. Um, yeah, if there was something else I was going to say, and then I kept having mic issues. No worries, dude. You can come back to your point whenever you want. It's not an issue at all. So, uh, is... go on, Dusty. Andy, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it, dude. So, so one thing I was thinking just now too, and maybe this was it, Mad Dog, was outside of you know obviously your kit and your uh, weapon customizations and a plethora of outfits and uh, weaponry we have. Something I love about Point a little while. Oh, we're, we're, we're losing you. Yeah, yeah, we're losing you. Yeah, you're bro. breaking up. Oh, shoot, how's that? That's better. Is that better? All right. So the gadgetry and breakpoint, I think, was just, just uh, play better. You know, to simulate you know, a ranger team and perform a 10-kilometer ruck. Well, I've got now a water canteen. I've got food rations that I can use that obviously give them uh, but it adds such a, a grand layer of immersion. You know, I can sit there and I can eat and I can drink like I'm actually out in the field. Um, and we would do that myself and uh, Slade Tyron. We would do rucks and we would take a break, stop, you know, pull security, eat some food, drink some water, change our socks, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so, and not just that, but having things like the missile strike uh, designator, um, obviously the newer, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the Asriel drone, you know, those, those types of things are just, they make the status a lot more, give us a lot of different options. Um, and Wildlands, I loved it too. I mean, I started my Milsim with Ghost Recon in Wildlands with the Slade Tyrant, um, and there was, I think we covered it on a very old podcast, Andy, and it was, you know, the life that the game had, you know, you had to watch where you shot. One of the biggest things we did in our Milsim was if you hit a civilian, the mission ends, you have failed, you done fucked up, basically. Uh, so no civilian casualties, making sure, you know, we, we kind of operated almost with within certain Geneva conventions. I mean, there's there's so much there that we could do. Uh, so right, I'm getting off on our rant, so I'm gonna shut up now. No, that's no, it's perfectly good. So um, <laughs> so we haven't heard from um, Sam, and we haven't heard from Delta yet. So um, do you want to come in on that about you know why Ghost Recon is the ideal game for, or at least you know, it definitely sounds like because of the situation on console where there just aren't the options for a lot of people, um, 
that you know there aren't a lot of other games out there on console yeah yeah there's a few but they're not quite the same and they're not open world um as such so what what is it about ghost recon sam i don't know if you want to jump in on this one or delta or um if you want to come in and say anything yeah sure i can um yeah i can add on to that well i mean if you think about it to be honest ghost recon is like lately the, the latest ghost recon like wildlands and breakpoint um you see the scale of the map and the environments that you have, it makes it really makes a perfect game for Nelson. And um, I just don't think that Ubisoft developed it correctly, and they didn't exploit that option, that Nelson option. They just tried to make like an arcade game because that was what it was at the beginning, but at least for a Breakpoint, you know. And uh, it really pissed me pissed me off that. It was an, um, they didn't exploit that option, that Nielsen option, because they have all the tools to, you know, to do it, to give it a try. And I think, like, it would have been way more successful if they were just, you know, kind of explore that option. Because now that you, um, the game has been out for, uh, I don't know, three, three years, four years now, I don't know. And the gaming base, like the player base of this game has been like it's been lower and lower each day. And it's because they made a game for a certain um group of people that they you know, they like a third person shooter and um but not in the Milsom style, you know. And that's why it has it had such a rough um, beginning. But if they would have just you know explored that option, that Milson option, it would have been such a great game. And I'm, I was I was really disappointed because you know I pre-ordered this game and I have thousands of hours to play it, and um, it's just really disappointing because it really has the potential to be a great Milson game, and even like for a console to run it and like because to be fair the game looks amazing and all the new elements that they implemented since Wildlands it was just amazing like the movement and what you guys were saying uh, earlier like you can drink water you can eat and you can like set up a camp and that's those are really great additions but they just didn't do it correctly like for Milson players so, Sam, you're just saying that because obviously it goes back from what um, Doc was saying earlier, um, and, and I think it was Dusty as well. So, when you're when you're doing Milsim operations, because obviously I know you guys tend to plan kind of certain operations and things like that. Do people yeah. do people utilize the canteen aspect and the eating and stuff like that? Because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not. You know, I've seen a lot about Milsim. I don't play it i just don't get time um but is that something that people is that all meal sims that do that or is it is it more just about the actual operations and how you're going to do them or is it, 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 it really depends and if, excuse me for you know interrupting um it really depends on how the meal sim, like these um meal sim group tries to play the game there's a lot of people that play the game like in a meal sim aspect as they will, as someone, as some unit in the real life would, you know, do an operation. But some other people just like to play the game in a Milson way, you know, in a hardcore style, like no HUD, no anything, but not that into Milson, like not that, uh, what, what you call it, um, not that realistic. For me, for example, I like in game, I do not use the rations, I don't eat both. Um, I have this stamina bar, um, I can't see it, and I have the stamina consumption on extreme, so, you know, if I run too much, I'll have to drink some more, and, you know, that's, I like the aspect, I like the, um, that, how they implemented that, but it's just, to be fair, on how they implemented it, 
it's just not the correct way. Like I'm just like my stamina is not gonna just regen out of nowhere because I just drink a sip of water, you know. But it just makes a cool aspect on the game. So your yeah. your um sorry sorry I, I'm just really quick. So your so for example in in each meal sim, obviously we know one of the things that is I tend to see in meal sims is that people obviously have um, ranks. So, for example, yeah. on on your Sam uh, JTF, and we'll get to some of the others as well in a second. So, who is your uh, is is Prime like your yeah, high, 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 okay Prime? So, so I need you to come in on this one then, Prime. So, yeah. okay. So, how do you is is the rank set by? I mean, is this your is this your how you set up do you know if others set up like this and we can get some different opinions i'm in, really intrigued explain to me how the rank structure works is it when new people join or you recruit because i'm intrigued to see how people recruit um and also we could give some tips to people who may listen to this and go yeah that's for me i want to join so you could we could go through a little bit more about that but tell me how the rank structure works so if if is it because you created it that you're that you're at the top, or is it? Do you? How does it all work? Uh, I'm intrigued. So generally, how it works. Uh, I'm also not like the founder of JTF21, but I'm up there. Um, so how it works is usually you'll get like, you know, a few really close friends that are like, "Yo, let's like start up a mill sim," or you'll have like people in the community that are like, "Hey, we want to like." do a, a mill sim of uh, like so and so or of this unit insert you know IRL unit here and then they'll agree so they'll start a discord server out and generally how it'll work is usually the people who started out since they're kind of the ones that have ran their whole process they've done their research they've done a bunch of stuff to figure out like Hey, what are like we gonna like implement to make this like realistic? Or, uh, yeah, are we gonna use like this rank structure? Or are we gonna use like how are we gonna format like our you know MOS certification courses and all that? Like, what methods are we gonna use for that? They're usually at the top because they have set up everything themselves to kind of know how everything goes. Then from there, any other additional like admins that you add in to help you out along the way or officers or senior NCOs they all have their own responsibilities that are assigned to them so not all of the workload is on you know like the handful of people that started out at the gate right so then from there you know obviously how people get to that position is it'll tend to be like you know somebody will join as like a recruit they do their their basic training. Every Milsom's basic training is different, um, and then you know from there, they would obviously you know start at the bottom of the you know the pecking order, um, and then each Milsom has you know different ways that you know they give out ranks, and then eventually that person just works up the ranks, and you know the higher up see it as. Okay, like this person's working up. That means he's dedicated. He's giving time in. He, that means he knows how to how everything you know kind of runs in this group. So that once he hits that certain stage, it's kind of like a we entrust this person to handle the responsibilities that now come to this certain um, what's the word I'm looking for? This certain like point that he is now hit climbing up the ladder. And then uh, more on to that. Uh, I guess how the rank structure works is obviously dependent on what unit your milsim has. So like, uh, like the 104 TFRA guys, I know they're more U.S. based, so like they'd have a lot more of the U.S. ranks. Me, at least the unit that I run, uh, being Can Softcom, that has more of like the Canadian Army ranks in it, and like. I guess White Death, who's running the Finnish side of things, he's got the Finnish, you know, ranks up in in his unit. So it, it, the ranks themselves kind of depict off of, you know, either like what an individual chooses, and then off of uh, more or less, you know, if you're basing it off of realism, what ranks 
those units that you are milsiming as use in the real world. So, and then um, as for how we get recruits in, and then I guess tips for people is you want to join, you know, public Ghost Recon servers on Discord, uh, use social media platforms if you want to, you know, the more the merrier when it comes to branching out. And then obviously you're going to have, you know, your certain criteria, like make sure you're a PlayStation player because we're on PlayStation and, uh, you know, groups have age restrictions because they don't want the immature people who fire explosives at your helicopter <laughs> to, you know, join their group. Uh, they want, you know, they don't want that. Um, so then moving on from that, it, it's like you just want to branch out as much as you can show in your advertisement that you're making on discords or social media that like you offer something unique or you offer unique a unique experience or um the stuff that you do that the other groups don't do and that way is actually good for not only your group if you were to like make one but it's actually good for like the milson community as a whole because it's essentially like a friendly like wake up call like so and so like somebody could go to go post and then they see your ad and they read it off and see like you do a certain thing and they're like hold up that's a good idea like we gotta do something or we gotta top that so then they try that and then it's just like a back and forth everybody's improving constantly because they're trying to like one up to be like hey look what we do kind of thing so then it just makes everything overall like the standard just goes up with that as time goes on. So it, it's it's just an all around like good experience, and obviously it'll vary uh, depending on what milsim you're in. So yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Is, is anyone else on any of the other milsims want to jump in and said do they do anything drastically different uh, to how that's done? Well, um, um, go ahead. You can. All right. Um, well, so I haven't done many um, Ghost Recon Milsons in a while. I've been more focused on like different games like DayZ and stuff, which have usually like you can have larger player counts in the game at a time. So um, the way that our ring structure works is it's like kind of like how do I say it's like um, you kind of gain like a better rank over time. Like if you if you go on a certain mission and like, you know, you get a certain amount of kills or you, if you're like, if you take someone hostage, all these things that like in game can like bring up your rank over time, but also a little bit also of the server things. Like if you help maybe like help someone out to, if they're a new moderator or something in the server and you help them out to like make the server better, then that can also help like bring up your rank. Oh, thank you. Who, it's, uh, Grandpa, you was going to jump in with something then? I think we all have the one thing that we all want to have is the activity. Um, most of us, we probably have the most inconsistency of active members. So being that once you find a group of people that are quite active, you want to keep them active as well. Whether it be in-game or in Discord, that's what makes it more fun. Um, as far as rank structure, I believe, like, uh, I forgot who said it. I think it was Sam or, or um, White Death who might have said it. Yes, the, the U.S.-based ones are using the U.S.-based military system. And um, the Europeans are using either the Canadian or the European base, whichever branch of uh, military they're choosing. But as far as rank, there's still the hierarchy as far as anybody else. As far as the comment from earlier with Tonka... Um, prior to the um, show starting, there is the the rule as far as um, spoken uh, speak when spoken to, but don't speak out of turn. A lot of times, that's only in the Discord and in or voice chats or in some type of group type meeting. But in the game, it's just fun and games there. And I mean, anybody uh, else want to add on to that? If I can. Uh, first off, hi, everybody. Sorry I'm late. Um, whenever me to... and Dusty... Shut up, Andy. <laughs> just, just, just 
Shut up. You are showing in your M16. <laughs> I, I was. I was totally showing off my M16, you know. But anywho, the way that me and Dusty ran kind of Wildlands and eventually whenever Breakpoint did come out and we slowly had our members move over to Breakpoint, um, we operated with multiple units under our Milsim. Uh, we uh, took on the moniker of Task Force 195. Uh, and we had, say, like, we had army at one point in time. Uh, we would have either basic infantry, your 11 Bravos, your Rangers, and then your Green Berets. Uh, rank structure was pretty standard, kind of what the rest of these guys were saying. Uh, most of it was time and service. Uh, basically, all that means is if you stayed with us and you showed uh, that you were willing to learn, assist, and progress, you we trained you up on how, what we had envisioned the Milsim to be like and how to help continue on that because you joined us because of that vision. Now we're telling you, hey, this is what you can do to assist. And then once you go through that training, you'll get your promotion. Um, or if we feel like you need a little bit more training, we'll uh, tell you what you need to work on. And then uh, for the units, it was more for the basic infantry. It was the guys who wanted to operate under a Milsim style idea but not really have it as something really in depth as far as life, like real life is concerned. And then whenever you got to the 75th, you started to show promise that, Hey, I do want to assist in this. I do want to take it to that next step. So how can I do that? You go through 75th training and we would get you into more advanced training, more ideas that we in, uh, implement per that tier. And then, uh, once you completed that, you got into um, you got into the seventy fifth, and if you wanted to progress from there, then it was basically the same thing. We had more ideas that were being implemented for ODA or Green Berets, and you would go through that similar training. You'd get selected um, because that was one where it was like, look, everyone here is friends. But the further up the tier you go, the more you start to become like family. We know basically what's going on in, I don't want to say it in your life, that's completely up to those people. But by that time, once they get to that place, and I'm pretty sure some of the other guys here can attest to it, they have connected with you in such a way that normally it means you know them by name, you know what their life is like, you know like where they live, uh, and what they're going through at the time. Because they're a lot more open with you. They're a lot more trusting with you about that. And it's it's a really humbling feeling to have uh, guys do that. But once they get to that level, or want to get to that level, then it's, okay, this is the gentleman's club section. You've been through this. You've gone through that. Now you're saying you want to be here. So we're not going to treat you like you're basic. We're not going to treat you like you're still trying to work your way. You're trying to end and be what this Milsim is envisioning. Uh, so we're going to basically hit you with the most that we can and see if that's something you want to do and if that's something that you can do. Uh, and then once you pass through that, we were uh, ready to sit there and say, sweet, you did this. This is typically what we do on these certain missions. Uh, now you can also assist down the ladder, down the tier, into the help molding other people who are like-minded to get into this position. Um, whenever it started to get to NCO ranks, like your E4 for the Army, the E4 Corporal, and up the E ranks, um, we started teaching more and assessing you more how you were as a teacher, how you were as uh, a leader, that sort of thing. And then even more so uh, for the like staff side of it, where you work with individual members and not just the whole Discord as a whole or individual like teams. Once you started going into officer, that's whenever you started getting ingressed into the way of actually helping out with administration and handling majority of the members of a unit. Um, and it was... It was a test here and there to make sure that everyone could do it who wanted to get there. And if you couldn't, we wouldn't sit there and say, look, 
you didn't do it. Now you got to go back to here. You can't progress. We would always try to allow that. There was one limitation uh, for it, and that was um, for like the the special unit, the tier ones um, in that group or in our group. And once you got to like ODA and you wanted to be like Delta, then that's whenever we would be like, okay, you're here. You want to be really up here and actually, you know, uh, do more behind the scenes with us about how to progress, how to do this and that and the other, and know what the potentials of movements and whatnot are from games or whatever. Um, this is where it's going to lay. This is the ground section. If you don't meet it, you can't get here. And uh, we were we were pretty strict on that. Uh, I know some Milsoms aren't like that, and that's completely fine. Uh, but for us, it was just a way to see who was willing. And if they made it, they made it. If they didn't, they didn't. There were guys that I would want to make it who it just sadly didn't. Um, and it was no hard feelings either way. They knew what they were signing up for. We knew what they were signing up for. We tried not to let our biases uh, of knowing the person to actually overtake that. Uh, yep. And that's how that's kind of how we did it. Okay, so I have some questions based off of what you just said and what was said before. So um, whoever wants to come in on this or multiple people, I'm really interested to see, A, how different meal sims do it and, and what this is. So we, I want to go back to the basic training thing. This is a thing that I'm interested in, really fascinated in. And what you just said, um, uh, Tyrant, about certain people not making it. So let's say you get some people that come in and they say, look, we want to be in your meal sim. So they're brought in. I presume that basic training is then arranged. How do you do basic training? So do you get one new guy in? Say, let's say you're doing it on break point. Do you get one new guy in with three already experienced guys and they take you through, see what you're like? What What is it you expect from that person? Um, how do you take them through basic training? Um, what are you looking for when you're taking them through basic training? Is it, do you want them to be particularly good at specific skill sets? Do you want them to be good at stealth? Do you want them like, what kind of things are you looking for in someone? How can you tell, no. that, how, how yeah. can you tell a player's having a bad day on that day as opposed to he's not actually a bad player? Um, I'm, I'm fascinated. And, and then if they don't, past basic training as such do you give them another go or do you kind of go no look I don't we, mean we to can, interject you well, uh, we can judge this and, and we'll get rid I of can, this person if i can say my end of it and then uh you it's gonna be fairly quick with mine and dusty's basic training there was no failing basic training you could go through our basic training and what you could go through our basic training and we'll teach you, uh, like, we wanted new players just as well as we wanted veteran players. Veteran players who obviously knew what they were doing, is like veterans to Milsim, and maybe even veteran players who knew kind of, like, basic, like CQC, for instance, how to breach a room, how to throw a flashbang, and all that sort of stuff, the mechanics of the game and whatnot. They would slowly progress a little bit faster. Now, setting this up kind of is a situational deal, or at least it was for us. If we had two recruits, we always tried to have at least two instructors. So even if we dealt with one person, we would still have two instructors there in case one of us had needed to go really quick for some reason and to just kind of overall keep general eyes and then discuss back and forth what we saw and kind of break down what was going on. While they're going through basic training, we set the ground rules, say, look, this is how it's going to be. Um, you're going to address us by our ranks. That's going to be the way the Milsim is. We don't care what you do outside of uh, Milsim time. Milsim time dictates that this is what's going to happen. Um, and we're going to have you go through this. We're going to give you an option to ask for permission to speak. And it's up to us whether if we want to finish our point or go ahead and let you ask your question uh, to do so. And then in the actual training, we'll take a look at about what they know and we will teach them either a how we want them to do things as or just basically again for brand new players to go streak on we'll sit there and say look you know you can do this with the game mechanic it really helps out here 
um, like a lot of the people coming from Wildlands who just picked up Breakpoint for the first time didn't realize that you could uh, swap hands with your flashbangs now in Breakpoint. So they were still trying to set up breaches on certain aspects of a door frame. And we're like, you don't actually have to do that anymore. You can do this or that if a situation comes to, you know, like a corner-fed door on this side or you have a little bit more cover on the other side, that sort of stuff. Um, the only way that you failed basic training was whenever you found out this isn't for me and you just left. Or you said, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. I don't want to be here. Or again, we've had some people just go like, you know what? Fuck this amount. Um, what if they refuse to talk to you and you said that you, you have a rank structure? What if they kind of come in, they're good, but they go... I'm not doing the rank thing. I'm not calling you sergeant. I'm not calling you whatever. Are they immediately? Then we basically tell them, look, that's just everyone else here does it. I've had veterans who have served 15 years. Uh, there was an army veteran who served 15 years in aviation uh, who had followed me in lockstep to other milsims and uh, even ones that he was a senior official on. And he would sit there and still call me sir. He'd still call me whatever even outside of Milsim. And I tried to, you know, hey, look, I don't want you to do that outside of Milsim. Milsim here is fine, but it's just like, look, dude, it's just that respect that I have. You do this, you do that. It's we. Everybody in the Milsim understands that the Milsim rank is literally just a Milsim rank. It doesn't dictate anything outside of what we're doing. Um, hey, to and, jump, to, Tyrant, to jump on that, um, there are some people who in the U.S. are brought up in the South and that is instilled into them as far as the sir and madam part. That is oh, yeah. probably most likely from family that has been brought up and said, you will always say sir to whoever it is that you're speaking to or, or madam. Right, yep. or madam. So um, even though you may have come across this particular person that does that, you don't know if they were brought well, up that way. he would just way. call me sir. He would still call me by my rank, which uh, it's really humbling, hmm. uh, first off, to have guys do that, especially somebody who had been in for 15 years. Normally, uh, veterans who come in are like, cool, yeah, whatever, I'll say it because that's what the you know rules is and I like what you guys do. And other guys are just, like, this guy was, the I guess, kind of the exception to that. And it's it's really humbling to have guys follow you like that. Um, yeah. and, I, I think Mad but, Dog wanted to say something also. Yeah, I'm going to finish up my point. I'm just about done. I've got one more. I know it was long-winded. I'm sorry about that, Mad Dog. If they did not want to do that, we would sit there and say, look, this is the way it is. We have other guys who want to do it. And if that's just not what you want to do, then we might not be the Milsim for you. And then we would either appoint them to other Milsims that are running that we know of, or just send them on their way. I'm done, Mad Dog. I'm sorry. Okay. Come in, Mad Dog. <laughs> it's all good, man. Uh, so I was going to speak up on TFRA's uh, DCT portion. Also want to let um, my guy who came in with me speak up on his portion because both of us do two different portions of our BCTs because uh, we have an army and a branch in our unit, in our task force. And um, basically how we do it is each branch has a different BCT phase. And army's BCT phase is more so of just a little quick introduction of formations and uh, CQB, CQC tactics that we do. And then we have a five-day phase of 18X training, which is um, our Special Forces candidate selection, which brings you into our first SFG unit and stuff. But um, that's portions that all involve, like, hey-ho, hey-lo, Q-course, all that different types of stuff for Army side. Now, if I can, I can get my dark side to raise his hand, and I'll back out and let him speak, because I know he has a... Very long portion that he, not very long portion, but another portion that he does for Navy. That is really interesting. I like for him to speak up on that. Yeah, if someone wants to jump down so he can jump up, whoever, either yeah. you or someone else, that's cool. I think he can come in. Is uh, he just got to, he has to hit the button now. I have seen that we've had 11 people in here. There we go. 
Yeah, I've been also been trying to get Kirillik in as well. Uh, so Kirillik, if you want to come in, just raise your hand in a minute and we'll, we'll get you up. I did try and get you in a little while ago, but I'm not sure if you saw it or not. Uh, you know, if you guys don't mind me stepping in real quick. Um, so for PC side, uh, a lot of people, especially when we get in with Arma, because again, like it's like next to impossible to get people on Ghost Recon for PC when you have other games like Arma, Squad, Hell at Loose. Um, games that really just do things better, even even if it's more or less multiplayer, it's just it's very hard for Ghost Recon to have an appeal on PC. So whenever we do like uh, stuff for Arma, a lot of people that come in already have like some milsome experience. So it's more or less on just getting them used to our mod sets, the ways that the way that we do things, and of course some units also do more extensive BCTs. Uh, but when it comes to, because I actually used to play um, Ghost Recon on PlayStation, uh, for me it was more or less about um, you get new recruits. Some some of them were veterans, some of them were not. But when it came to like the people who weren't really veterans, we did what we call the slowing down phase. Um, a lot of people, especially the more casual people, uh, they would try to treat Ghost Recon like a Call of Duty or a Battlefield, and they would try to run and gun blow through doors, not really pie things. Um, and again, like, Gross Street kind of is great because they actually have, like, very arcade uh, difficulties. But when you're trying to be a Milsim, uh, you tend to ramp that up a bit, and a lot of these players are not used to that. So the best way to do is just slow them down, saying, hey, slow, smooth, smooth, is fast, and get them used to proper tactics, whether it's CQC, Urban Warfare, or more um, Open Field Warfare. Uh and once we got them to kind of rewire their brains and have them start, you know, hitting the drums to a, a now it's more different beat than what they're used to, they tend to find uh, harder difficulties, not that much harder now, obviously. And they're able to now get into that Milsim um, experience. So that's just something that I've noticed uh, as well when it comes to BCT, especially with Ghost Recon. Okay, let's go. So let's get Dark Side in then, because uh, that's uh, as uh, Mad Dog said, he had uh, quite a few bits to say on this. How do? Um, few things um to touch base on, I guess. And, and I only say this as an aspect from someone who has not really done real sims. I've only just started, maybe about less than a year ago. Um. My whole reason for getting into a milsim is that I was tired of pressing that damn match matchmaking button. Um, after I got into this milsim, I haven't had to press it since. And it's about the camaraderie. Being able to run with someone that you're cool with, regardless of the game. That's pretty much what we're looking for. It's a hit and miss, and it does happen more than not. How we uh, implement it on our side, especially for new people, whether you're veterans or whether you're just downloading the game, is through our training session. It is a four-day process or a four-game session process um, that does implement everything that we do run, but specifically has us test them out whether this is the right thing for them and whether we think it's the right thing for them and whether we can meet in the middle. Most of the stuff that we already do, they already know. We're just putting a name to it. They like it, they stick with it. They don't, then they move on. It's just the type of player that you get. Um, a lot of people are really interested in it and they want to do it. So we try to make it as in-depth as possible. Um, the tactics that we receive, everything that they get into, and the people that we all connect with, being able to run with more than one person, someone different every time, maybe even play different games. It's just about having that relax and we like it. So we keep doing what we love. So our training session is more to the fact of, hey, we're just out here playing the game. We got an organized plan on how to do it. Yeah, we can talk and bullshit, but we can pin our ears back when it's time to do it. And, you know, some realize it and some are just fly by night. And it is what it is. You don't get paid for it. You just come out here and have fun and play. And that's what we like to do. Um, that's what we implement in our training sessions. 
And after people go through, they help out themselves to feel like they're included. And as long as we make everybody feel included and we all keep a gear inside the wheel, inside the machine, then the machine won't break down. And we're all cool with that. We like it. We're thriving on it. It's taking a little bit more than enough, but we're taking our time for it. So anybody that will be interested, we're the one to come by. No, uh, that's cool. Um, just, just really quickly, before I start moving on to the next subject, so a couple of subjects I really want to talk about. Um, so maybe White Death or Prime, could you just take us through maybe your basic training before we move on to the next subject, so what, what you do with it? Yeah, sure. Um, so essentially, our it's basic training process um, kind of takes the model of kind of how uh, essentially essentially how the Finnish military kind of does stuff a little bit, um, which is we kind of bring you in and kind of evaluate where you are. Um, essentially we have them clear a base and it's just to see what they can do. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Kind of what is their play style? What is their, you know, cause you're going to have people that like to snipe. You're going to have people that like to, you know, be up close. And so kind of our first phase is kind of seeing how they like to work and then, um, you know, if they know certain things versus other things, you know, we don't cover what they already know. Um, if they know it and they kind of know the name for it and they can do it, then we don't really, you know, beat a dead horse essentially on that. Um, but yeah, essentially we, we bring them in, kind of evaluate where they are and then we kind of cater our basic training uh, per se to kind of where they're at, um, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Um, so let's say if they're, you know, if they're more of a long game player, well, maybe we don't really have to go over, um, you know, using, you know, a sniper at long distances. Not that we really do that in basic, but maybe it's not so much, oh, can you shoot your weapon? Because if they're a sniper, they demonstrate it. They obviously know what they're doing. So we may kind of tune our kind of basic training process more into, hey, you know, maybe your your close game isn't as good, so let's cater that. Really make you a well-rounded person um, before we send you to one of our units. So our, our Milsim has I think 13 or 14 different units from uh, seven different nationalities. So we have a very standardized uh, basic training. Once they go complete that, they essentially get sent to X unit, whichever one they choose. And that unit may have kind of additional things for them. Um, I don't know how Hansoff really does it in particular, but I know essentially my, uh, Finsoft guys, I generally bring them in first day when they get done with their basic training, quote unquote, I ask them, Hey, here is kind of the, the trainings you can do. Here's kind of the, the routes you can take, um, which is most appealing to you. And I kind of help talk them through if they have like questions and essentially they spend their time, um, kind of tuning to that. So I have a pretty lengthy sniper course of, you know, people want to do that route. That is something they can do. Um, but overall just evaluating what they already know, what they can do. And then, um, essentially just catering the training per se to what they may be kind of deficient on before we hand them over to, um, you know, the official units per se. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question just really quickly from something you just said? So 
let's say you get someone come in and you said, I think you said the first thing you did was to get them to clear a base so you can see where they are. So what if this person comes in and tries to clear a base and fails and then they try again and they fail? What what kind of, what do you do then? Is it something that you think, well, we can improve this person or do you, is it at this point you go, they're not for us? Um, it kind of depends on essentially are they, trying to fail or are they trying to um because you know i don't want to say that someone's like bad at the game essentially um but if they aren't really kind of where we think they should be um because they when they come into the server they kind of have a brief little two minute not even two minute like 30 second survey do you have any military service? Do you have any milsim experience? Um, so obviously if they check, you know, I have military service and I have military experience, the bar kind of gets set a little bit higher for them. I expect, you know, I expect them to kind of be on point what they're doing. But um, essentially we don't really fail them at all unless... Um, there's kind of a mutual agreement that this isn't really for them. And if that's the case, um, we essentially point them kind of maybe, maybe a different milsim is something more beneficial for them. But I wouldn't say that we really like fail people and throw them out. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty patient person, so I'm willing to work with them. Um, but at the end of the day, before they get to, the actual units they need to be they need to have the basics down um where they can move on to you know mtog or uh, eto or ggk or something like that but yeah hopefully that answers your yeah no absolutely question. no definitely answers the question so now we've had a few different people now explaining you if know if i can speak up real quick yeah go for uh, it about you which your question of uh, people passing or failing? Mm. I think more so uh, what people what causes people to pass or fail is the failing portion is more on like them, depending on how they come through with their attitude and stuff like that, or if they cut up too much. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's a milsim. You're here to do one thing, but if you come in and you're playing with that solo type attitude, I think that's what causes people to fail, and. TFRA, we've had people with that type of attitude come in, they cut up, do stuff out of line, they don't want to act serious, they don't want to play to the serious portion of things, and I think that's what gets people kicked out. Because that would be the only way, in my opinion, for a lot of people to fail, is just their attitude. And like they said, it's just not for them. It causes them to get wiped out. No, that sounds might... about similar from what I heard across the board. It was the same with us. If you weren't there to be serious, then it just wasn't for you. Um, people who want to be there will prove to that they want to be there. Um, those that don't will inevitably show their hands that they don't. And do you know what? I yeah. think anyone watching this or listening to this who has ever considered joining a Milsim, I think what everyone across the board has just said will actually be quite a comfort to them. Because I do, there's probably people out there that think that they might enjoy the game, but don't believe they're necessarily great at the game. And nobody here has kind of said, look, you know, most people have said, we'll work with you. Um, it's more about your attitude. So I think anyone out there who wants to join a Milsim may listen to that and go, and, oh, okay, it's just about the attitude more than it is that, you know, I'm not that great, but, you you know, you guys could possibly make them a great player. And I think that's probably quite comforting to some people. Yeah, when, so I first joined, like... when I first joined my first Milsim on Wildlands, I was scared shitless. I, I wanted people to play with. I knew that Milsims were serious. And whenever I first went into one, I was I was terrified, and the it, more so because the owner of the Milsom was there, and he took me and he sat aside, and he was like, "Look, have you done this before? Uh, no. Okay, then 
are you nervous about it? I was, I was like, yeah, I don't want to leave a bad impression. He goes, do you want to be here? I was like, yeah. He's like, good, you left a good impression. Now show us what you can do. Yeah, I think, like, for any form of Milsim, uh, 90 to, like, 95% of the units you'll come across, especially as a new player who's listening to this, um, as long as you want to be there, as long as you show dedication, as long as you're willing to admit, hey, I don't have the experience, but I'm willing to learn, we all get it. We will all there at one point, and we get that you have to start somewhere. So there will be a lot of leniency to you, but if you just show up being... I don't. I want to make sure this stays YouTube friendly. But if you show up thinking that you're the the second coming and all this other stuff, and you disregard things, you're not gonna make it. But I'm pretty sure that if a lot of if a lot of people who are new, especially who have listened to this far in the podcast, you're probably gonna come in more humble enough than you ever would realize. So relax, take a deep breath. And then enjoy your experience because, again, a lot of us, we were there at one point and we get it. We get that there's that nervous feeling. Uh, you want to be really cool. You want to be really awesome. But you also want to work and really feel like you're a part of something. And we get it. And we will help make sure that you'll get to that point. As far as um, here's a question. And I know two of the three um, groups in here already. So um, I know people from JTF and especially Mad Dogs TFRA. Now, uh, Tyrant, your group is new to me um, as well. But as far as like role playability, I know some groups do that heavily, and some people just say we do this. What are, what are you guys doing? I know, like I said, JTF and and Red Arrow. I know their positions on it already. What about the rest of you guys? And if you still want to answer, that was actually. So, gonna, that, can I just jump in? That was actually going to be my next question. So good question there, Grandpa. I was actually going to ask how you put your operations together, uh, which is kind of the same thing. Do, do you pre-plan things? How do you set them up? Do you do you do them on the fly? Is someone planning them, you know, setting them up so you know what you're doing the following week? I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how it's all kind of set up, which flows into what uh, A-Up just said. In fact, if you want to go ahead, I'll pick up after you. So for Arma, it's very hard uh, for us to have this form of individuality because a lot of our mods are also our aux or we call auxiliary mods, which is um, mods catered to that specific unit. We have a unit uh, looking, we have uh, you know, different colors, whatever you know, whatever you have. It's in what we call the aux mod. Um, so. And a lot of that is just for everyone in general. Like, hey, if you're going to be a basic rifleman, this is this is your this is your uniform and stuff. Uh, because unfortunately, a lot of the what we call the van, uh, vanilla assets are either just too generic, or it it leaves room to be desired when it comes to immersion, especially if you're trying to be like a more realistic uh, fighting force. With Ghost Recon, you know, back when I ran things over there. Uh, one of the things that we uh, I tried to do is we, we tried to at least either a uh, pick a unit. Uh, one of the one of the main things we did was like a, a joint task force unit, and I was actually uh, in charge of the SES European uh, section. So we were more based SES. You know, our, our uniforms were more based on well either SES from the UK or New Zealand or stuff like that was really uh, designed uh, to look like. But then also try to you know. I like to give people the ability of into, uh, of that individuality kind of feel to it, uh, within reason, of course. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it just kind of goes for uh, what do you, what are you trying to accomplish of the unit, and as a leader, you're trying to figure out okay, at what point do I have to start putting the hammer down on you know what what we do, how we look, and how we go about things. Uh, when it comes to Arma, again, it's just. The sandbox. If you haven't experienced it, it is we, what we call um, people who create the ops, who run the ops. You call them Zeus's, and they're really not com like they're just they're kind of like the god of the server, and they're controlling everything down. They, they they don't really get that much fun, so it takes a very special person to be a Zeus and Arma. And yeah, but it, everybody it, doesn't have Arma either. I mean, we're it, we're trying yeah, to. But, but but what I'm trying to say though is that um, it's very hard to uh, 
once we have something set, it's very hard to deviate from that. Or with Breakpoint or Wildlands, it's like, okay, we could do a patrol mission, and if for whatever reason we feel like uh, we should deviate from that, we can. Uh, unfortunately, with Arma, it was it was one of those things where um, it, you will take hours building an op, and you can't deviate from that. So if mid-op something wasn't going right, you're kind of stuck with it. And that's one of the things that I want to I want to be a cautionary tale when it comes to the next Ghost Recon is that, well, yes, we could you know hopefully we are able to to design better missions for ourselves, but be able to have a bit more of a flexibility for us to deviate from that if we need to. So for my guys in the Ghost Recon uh, units, role play kind of went uh, two ways. Obviously, you're there in the unit. You're wanting to uh, you're wanting to milsim. Milsim has uh, or military has specific uh, MOSs or military occupation services. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, doc. Um, or Ada, any veteran here? Uh, we we didn't want people to try to sit there and be like, "Hey, I can do this." oh, well, I can also do this, I can also do this, I can also do this, and, you know, be a major jack-of-all-trade. Um, we wanted people to feel like they had their thing that they were supposed to master. So if you were a saw gunner, you knew how to run a saw gun. You knew how to train people to run a saw gun. You knew what the spreads were for each individual weapon that we allowed you to use. You knew how to effectively use it on ground or on foot. You knew how to utilize it in the air if you were special forces and you needed to. Uh, that sort of thing. And that role was basically what you were interested in doing. Um, as far as like an actual like role play into it, in missions, we added some sorts of uh, setbacks or fail, uh, like fail options. Uh, in particular, in Breakpoint, we had a uh, major mission that was supposed to be going down in Liberty City. Well, in order to make sure that civilian lives were kept at a minimum, and if it actually got out of hand we were sent to go and reinforce the hospital. So we would have a squad go to reinforce the hospital or clear it. And then we'd send another group in there behind it to reinforce it and hold it and all that sort of stuff. All of this was completely done in theory because you can only have four people in games, but that sort of stuff we implemented into it to kind of make sure that everybody who could get time in the operation was still going to get time in the field and still like they were accomplishing something. Um, there was one point that the special forces, or not the special forces unit, but the special uh, the unit that we had going in to clear it out, uh, they did it at night, and they thought that the best way to do it was to destroy the generator. As soon as we noticed that the generator was destroyed, um, whoever was the person who wrote the uh, operation, for us, nine times out of ten, it was Dusty. It was something that he loved to do. Um, he would get on the wire with whoever was uh, the lead or who, whoever was there to kind of like help moderate and make sure, as well as be there to have fun. Hey, you guys need to come back to base right now. Leave don't make a sound, don't make a move, don't make a no or not a move, don't make a noise, don't let anybody know you were there. Get back to base. Missions toast. And the reason why is whenever they took out the generator, they it's a hospital. You just took out life support systems, you took out uh, refrigeration systems with vital medicine, you just completely ruined the infrastructure of that hospital. And now we can't have our name tied to that because that makes us look like the bad guy sort of thing. And whenever that happened, we were like, we're going to have to figure out another way to clear it out, get these guys out without making it seem like we did this. And then so we sent a more direct approach to engage, clear it out, and then uh, 
we would have guys hold on and wait for a certain amount of time. If any reinforcements came, delete the re- or not delete the reinforcements, but engage them, get rid of them, whatever. And then uh, that would be them holding it, and that would be where the mission ends. They're going to stay there. Whenever their next assignment comes up, they're going to get their equipment. Someone's going to go ahead of them, eliminate all the hostiles that are there currently, have them insert have at the hospital, and have them continue basically on like as if they never left the game. Uh, certain amounts of role play you can't get. There's no way. Uh, I've been in units that were sitting there going like, okay, we're going to set this base here as our main base to meet up and whatnot. And in my mind, I'm like, there's, we already have a perfect spot to meet up an air one, or maybe in the, uh, outcasts location or their hideout. We don't need to fight the game every time we get into a, the server to make our initial point. Um, some people do it. I was not one of those. I felt like that was a bit too, too hard to maintain especially since in Breakpoint, we're up against a larger force um, that can, at the time, seemingly keep getting reinforcements into the island. Um, It's hit or miss with Ghost Recon, uh, especially with Breakpoint. And Wildlands was a bit easier because more things became available as more DLCs came. Uh, Like that airstrip where you go to meet um, Walker... Uh, and then there's just some aspects of it to where you can like throw a sprinkle in certain things to make ops seem more uh alive. Like there's actually consequences to what you're doing, and there's actually gains to what you're doing. It's a very difficult balance to play. It's doable, but it again, Ghost Recon made it very difficult to do that. That's, no, I, that's a good explanation. A- anyone else want to go through how they plan their ops, maybe for JTF or one of the other guys? Yeah, um, if I may. Also, if I do cut out, just a warning note, there is a thunderstorm here. I will whip over on my phone, pop that on so I can still be in here. But it's that's just if I cut out. Um, but as for how ops go in JTF 21, so we have a few types of ops that happen. So obviously we have like, 13 or 14 or so units under, I think, like, five to seven different uh, national commands. Uh, So how it'll work is you have your own in-house units, and that'll essentially be... Well, okay, first off, you have, like, your own campaign sets. So, you know, like, breakpoint, we could say, oh, like, we're, we're fighting the Russians on... Uh, Ukraine or something, right? And then it could just be, boom, and you just put conquest mode on, and there you go. Now you have like Russian targets up, and then you could utilize, you know, current world circumstances to kind of match hand in hand with like a fictional NATO counterattack or something like that. Uh, so you, you just pick a campaign out, so you have an end goal, I guess an end purpose for your operations so it kind of makes sense and it immerses into the game better and then from there uh essentially how it'll work is each unit will get their target deck uh and then from their target deck they'll also get their operational statements their aos etc um then from there you get you know a team out of that unit they're going to go in, they're going to do a reconnaissance patrol, they're going to monitor routes, just seeing, you know, how often enemy VIX are rolling around on, on the routes, they're going to pull up on the base, they're just going to get head counts on, you know, the base that their targets are on, or their objectives, and they're going to find, like, path of least resistance in, good observation point for any overwatch elements, etc. Then, you know, they might entice a gunfight slightly just to see how, you know, the QRF response is, like, how do the reinforcements come in? Um, And then, from there, you know, we have specific units that are tailored to doing the recon. Uh, So, they'll run the recon out, and they'll feed the recon reports back. And then, each unit will 
go in if it's in-house op only like let's say it was just Cansoft doing it you know there might be just a JTF2 element on the ground running their set of objectives or there might be JTF2 and Seesaw running their objectives simultaneously and then over the net you only have team leads speaking amongst each other uh, just saying like hey like this is going on like we're at phase line 2 or whatever right and then additionally you might have JTF ops as a whole so like four task force so it'll be the same thing but just on a larger scale you have like you know the Udi Jaggers from the Finns hitting out objectives you got you know, Swedish SOG hitting out their objectives you got FSK hitting out their objectives all for the purpose of you know potentially undermining a certain plot or certain enemy goal that could be happening in the AO um, you know um, as for how the actual op will go in regards to figuring out what the targets are literally get on the game for 10 minutes look around on the map be like oh you like these these bases chained together could make sense um, I'm trying to think of an example we had one where it was up in the mountains, the Aroa data farm. So you had the, uh, I can't remember the s spot north of it, but it was like essentially it provided water cooling for the data farm there. So you'd go, you'd hit that out, and the data farm would overheat, and all of a sudden, like you just move in on the data farm, get your objective done. So we'll like kind of piece together pieces of the puzzle as to like what objectives tailor to what and then what the objectives on each base will be or landmark or if we're doing a patrol just what is the purpose for it and then essentially we just get a photo of the map we edit it up and then you post your briefing in your briefing you'll state like you know what MOS's are recommend recommended and what uniforms you should wear and depending on the unit, the uniforms will differ. Um, and then, you know, you might have a certain ROE in the area. Like if you're in Liberty City, guaranteed civilians on sites. So you want to, you know, keep weapons a little bit tighter. If you're, like, on uh, Camp Tiger, I think. Yeah, Camp Tiger, that wolf base on the island, you know, hey, like, this is a wolf base. Probably no civilians here. Literally just, you know, show not immediately pull trigger like right away but likely you're going to run into contacts here so the ROE would loosen slightly um, and then obviously before you step off during the op team leader is going to get you know the kit that everybody's running their equipment he's going to run it into the armory check out so now we know like hey you acquire the tools that you were using for the job, and then if you were using any VIX or any air assets, you essentially just state that that's being used, and then you come in and just run your op. That's pretty much how it goes. I don't know. Like, Can I ask a question, bro? Yeah, go for it. Have you ever utilized, uh, like, mission objectives to help determine what the world mode was going to be? Like, uh, say, hitting... Uh, places where Azrael drones launched and destroying the Azrael drones on site to help, you know, change the world's uh, selection to not having any Azrael drones flying over for the next mission? Uh, I can't speak if that happened for a GTF as a whole, but for Cansoft, I can't say that we did have a m mission where we went and took out... Um, essentially like an enemy air base. So we kind of lowered the Asriel patrols because figuratively if there wasn't any Asriels present, it would be like, oh, well, we damaged the runway so they can't land anymore. So then, you know, it's like, oh, they can't land here. They got to fly over to the next province in order to, to, to refuel or be able to, like, do anything from. So then we'd lower the Asriels off for that region for the time being. Um, but as for uh, any real type of stuff like that, uh, yeah, we had a couple where it was like, you know, 
basically like that, I guess you could say. I mean, we uh, with mine, we did something similar. We operated in, uh, uh, what is it, Restricted Area 01, where you have the uh, wolf base, the Black Arrow site, where they launched yeah, the other yeah. from. We took those out, and then we stole some weapons for the outcasts, and so for that next mission or the next series of missions, depending on how long they went, you had no Azrael patrols until more got shipped there, and then you had outcast fighting with Sentinel. Yeah, yeah, that's that's happened. Uh, I'm trying to think like like every now and then we'll do like turnover ops to uh, I can at least speak for the Sea Sword th- side of things. We do a lot of A and A in real life. At least three out of the five regiments do. So. You know, if we're like rolling in on uh, op on wildlands, let's say, uh, since we're working hand in hand with indig forces, you know, we might call in like a rebel fire team in, and then we'll hit out like this little base, and then if we hit that base out, just to be like a cool immersive for at least real world activities for what each unit entails to doing, it would be like, hey, we hit this with the rebels. Now we do turn over all the technicals that are here. Like they now have all the you know, weapons and ammo and food stuff, like it's going to them to help their cause out, you know. So we do, like, cool stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, like, generally everything kind of has its own loop into it. Uh, I think, like, yeah. a cool one that happened was we had an op where we had SOG and one of the FinSoft units roll in on two HVTs, and then we had Etsoft blow all the bridges around this one area of a coral in wildlands and then uh cansoft and one of the other finsoft units went in and we hit like major strong points and kind of sabotaged enemy vix and everything at these strong points and fuel tanks etc so then it was like hey like if you see the enemy like there like they can't get away type thing you know what i mean like we kind of just tighten the noose on those hvts you have a lot of stuff going hand in hand on that, and kind of everybody does their part, and yeah, it's it's pretty cool, you know. So I figured other Milsims did that, but I kind of wanted to ask that question to show anybody that's watching the podcast that it's a lot of Milsims say they do things different and they do have their own unique perspective, but there's a lot of stuff that's similar idea, and it's it's shared amongst a lot of the Milsim community, especially if you have two Milsim units that go in to do a JTO together, which some of those are pretty yeah. cool. I'm going to say, I'm going to be honest. I found it massively fascinating so far. Just listening, it's quite weird. I've, if you look back over the last say ten podcasts, not that this is quiet, but this has been one of the quietest podcasts in terms of people are actually I speaking like... and, and listening. I'm fascinated listening. To it. <laughs> yeah. So what, I so feel like we're... this is. Uh... I feel like this is something that, I mean, obviously you have your raid guys, you have the guys who do Ghost Recon. The Milsim guys have been in kind of like the backlight. It's not really shown face too much, aside from like recruitment posts, pictures to kind of advertise each other. We've never really had a chance to speak about our world view in Ghost Recon like this before. So I feel like everyone thinks it's a bit important to kind of shine it into light finally. Well, that's... That's great. Sorry, just to cut you off, but I mean, that's why I think it's so important that, you know, hopefully channels like ours exist because we don't want to just appeal to one group of people. We want to be able to have the voices of everybody in the community. It doesn't matter what, how you play the game, whether you're the complete opposite of Milsim and you're a very, very casual player, you should still be listened to. You know, you're still purchasing the game, you're still having input. The same as Milsim and, and anything else. And in fact, my, my very last question um, a bit later is going to be around that. So I'm going to get to that. But I do want to ask a question, but I'm going to let Defect come in and then I'll ask a question. So I want you to think about it. Um, is there competition between Milsim groups? And why is there competition between Milsim groups? So I'll let Defect come in and then have a think about that and let me know. So uh, let me just say the one thing I was going to say, I actually do have an answer for that question as well, so I'm going to pay back off of that. So uh, one of the things my Milsim uh, did way back when was uh, for our story, we just kind of like went along as we played. And at the end of every op, we just kind of like had like a little chat tab and we would, you know, 
write down our debrief, what happened, what's going on, some intel we got, and the next unit that went out uh, would just kind of piggyback off of that. And it created uh, a very unique storyline, and uh, it also creates some very funny moments, um, one of which I think was kind of funny. If Ubisoft are listening, listen listen to this one, because this is actually kind of funny. So one of the things we had was that uh, we had a newer guy who tried to take command of a unit, and at first it was just three of them. I eventually joined in late, and because I was late, I was kind of more like the Overwatch guy. And, you know, they're taking out this base, and things get a little wild. And there's like this one random soldier left, and he and you know of course the whole op was more or less a mess, but we're just working with it because we're just having fun. He's like, grab that guy, grab that one guy. So of course they grab that one guy, they grab him in a helicopter, they fly off like you know wherever, set down, grab the guy, and the dude was like, all right, you're gonna tell me something. Where's Walker? And we just start laughing. It's like you do realize Walker's dead already like spoiler alert but walker's dead in the game already he's like oh where's walker's brother <laughs> so now we're just like oh. so uh, i remember putting in in the debrief it was like so all this you know thousands millions of dollars that you know the cia and mi6 pumped in for all this intel and some random grunt grabbed some other random grunt and strikes Intel Gold, and apparently Walker had a brother that we now have to go hunt. And apparently we decided that Walker's brother name is Frank Castle, if you guys ever get the reference. So now we have to find Frank Castle, and I get, and, and we, we, we spent a month just saying, okay, we're going to do all this other stuff before we finally find Frank Castle. Again, if you guys don't know who Frank Castle is, that's the guy that Walker played as in The Punisher. Um, so there's, there's a little nod to a reference and, you know, it, it was fun and it was very, very funny. Um, and we actually had a lot of fun with it as far as, you know, going to the other question that bullet catcher asked, which was, is there competition between Milsims? I like to say a big yes and a big no. Um, one of the things that drives me insane is that every unit is trying to do their own separate thing and they're always trying to do it to how they want to do it. For whatever reason, and I've seen it, uh, I don't want to name names, uh, but I have seen it, especially in the Ghost Recon community, is that units think that they have this unique thing to themselves, which makes them all holier than God, which is not the case. And they think that people will try to steal their ideas. But here's the thing with Milsim, is that Milsim already has a very, like, I won't say strict, but it has a parameter to what really makes a Milsim a Milsim. And it's up to the unit to decide how they want to go about that. Do they want to be really, really serious? Do they want to be casual? Or do they want to be like a semi-casual kind of unit? But for there are some units that feel like, oh, we got people that might be spying on us, this and that. And I'm like, dude, a lot of what you, a lot of what you guys are doing is what a lot of other units have been doing for years. You're not special. You know, you're you're not worth the effort that someone, you know, that, that someone needs to put in in order for them to, quote unquote, infiltrate you, and steal your ideas. It's it's not. It doesn't even go down like that at all. But unfortunately, there is units that feel that way. They feel like, oh, people are just spying on us, stealing ideas. Well, let, let's let's let's, let's ask the, let's ask the question to the other units then. So, do, do, does anyone actually feel like that? Does anyone think that? Does anyone I have know, those feelings? Or? So, we in my unit, uh, we we found out pretty quick that other units had kind of a similar structure and idea. And it's I'm gonna go ahead and say defect. That was probably the best way to put it. It's a big yes and no on that answer uh, for that answer or for that question. Uh, we actually had a guy come in, he got to train basic training, and then whenever he left, he got, I don't remember what he got disgruntled by, um, but he got disgruntled with something, and he took the documents with him and tried to make another Milsim with it. And at one point, we we don't care, uh, because it's, a Milsim is a Milsim. Everybody has that foundation, and that foundation is basically the same it's the bare basic idea that you found yourself on and then you build the uniqueness to it 
what we took exception to was he didn't just want to take the foundation that we used. He wanted to take the uniqueness that we had and make his own to, I guess, kind of be better. I don't know. And some guys are willing to share their documents and whatnot. And um, I was never one of those guys because I felt it was a little pointless. Uh, because, again, it's, everyone knows the basics. Everyone has those basic structure already. Um would I help and, you know, pitch ideas? Absolutely. But, like, to go ahead, you know, say, oh, we do it this way. Do you do it this way? We do it this way. Nine times out of ten, you'll hear the same thing from everyone else. Um, we did take exception to the fact that he wanted to try and take what made us unique, unique, and be better with it. And that's, again, the competition side of it, mainly pertains to recruitment, especially have milsims that really get borderline similar with yours. Everybody wants to have members. Everybody wants to have members that are active. Everybody wants to, you know, have guys that they can get on with and have fun. But we're not the only ones. Other units are wanting to do it as well. So yeah, there's a bit of competition with the recruitment side of it, but overall, not really. Normally, if you have two Ghost Recon milsims sit there and say like, hey, we want to do this and we want to do that, uh are you interested in doing it? Most of the time you'll sit there and have people be like, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. There's uh, more exception to that than I'm letting on. Um, but for the majority of it, from what I've seen, it's Milsim, the Ghost Recon community in Milsims um, is a very, very, uh, it's almost feels like a bit of a brotherhood. Everyone knows what we're trying to do. There's no point in trying to be competitive about who has the better strategy because it's all based on the same foundation. So if another Milsim unit wants to sit there and say, hey, why don't we, you know, have two guys from you, your group and two guys from ours, you know, have fun, hit it off and, you know, operate a little bit. See if we can't, you know, kind of like bounce ideas off of each other and see, you know, what the other, the other units are like. Um, and that's, I guess that's the best way that I can answer that. It, it, it you're obviously going to have your rival, uh, your sibling rivalry in this uh, analogy, but well, well, they're video games, aren't they? Not. So you're always going to get well, certain yeah. rivalry, and you know, oh, yeah. a lot of games are built around competitiveness. So you're going to isn't going to have that. There is there is a level of toxicity from some milsims who do think they are holier than thou. But majority of the time, I know I've operated with Doc, and we've ran two Milsims uh, separate from each other, and we've, I think, what, the first time that you and I actually did uh, a mish, a series of, like, uh, oper not operations, but those um, missions, uh, faction missions, it was, it was like we had operated for a while together. The similarities are too too pronounced to really have a rivalry about. So it's, again, it's more like a brotherhood. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Does, that, does anyone else want to come in on that before? I, any other guys? I, want I, I, do, I, I, I do think want Delta's to... been trying to get in. Bring him in. I'm sorry, Delta. <laughs> I can't hear him. Del no, he's not. Delta, you there? No, can't hear him at the moment. No, no, I couldn't hear him at the beginning of the podcast when we were doing the testing. I, I couldn't hear him either. Um, not sure what's going on there, but um, if no one else wants to get in on that, we'll. Um, I want to move on to the to the. This is kind of my final question as we're approaching the kind of two hour mark. We try not to go too much over two hours. Um, well, I. I do have one before you get to your final one. There. Go for it. All right. So I know that most of us, as far as the Milsim community, is against backdoor recruiting. And I know we all hate it. But at the same time, we're sharing information today as far as what we do, what we can, and what we don't do. And, you know... What do you guys feel like as far as I know the backdoor recruiting is a no-no for anybody, but how do you feel if one person is in multiple milsims? I, um, so I think if I may, uh, you could go, Doc, if you want. It's all good. Well, 
that's defect. But I, I know one thing I've noticed is that, you know, oh, going shit. back to the other question is that we are all so much alike that it's not really about multiple mill sims. It's about there is someone that wants to get more mm-hmm. action and being in more mill sims, you know, clearly has more time on his hands. He wants to be able to get more time and and work with people. As I said, it's like I, I've. I don't think that's ever been an issue for me, um, and primarily because at the end of the day, th- the foundation is so broad and it's so overreaching to what we all do anyway. That is, it's just it's more or less the little things that separates us. But at the end of the day, that that's really about it. And if someone wants to be in multiple milsims, it's it's not because they're trying to do something malicious it's more because they have more time and there is a lot of time where they're not doing what they want to do as far as a milsim wise and they're trying to find other units to to, so that they could plug in those times so they could get the time that they want playing a game that they love to play makes sense um prime do you want to come in with what you were going to say yeah so uh as for like being a multiple milsims to get more action or just for whatever purpose you want to be a multiple, there's the, there's the difference between like being a backdoor recruiter and being a multiple milsims. Being a multiple milsims is fine, uh, but there's an incident that happened, and I, I know I even contacted Eight Up about this because just to give him a heads up. But we had an individual in our milsim who was only in for about two weeks. You know, we were accepting, we welcomed him in, and everything. Uh, and then, you know, he, without, you know, letting any of us know, just randomly left, and all of a sudden, I'm getting flooded with DMs from, like, six different people going, like, you know, this guy's literally messaging me, telling me to leave JTF and go join him, because we suck, or, like, a bunch of stuff, right? And then, that's where I'd say, like, the line kind of gets crossed from being in, like, multiple mill sims to then just being petty and then, like, starting to, like, attempt to backdoor recruit. Like, if you're in multiple mill sims, perfectly fine. But if you're in, like, if you're in another mill sim just to try to gain members into your own mill sim and you're doing a bunch of snaky and shady stuff, uh, and then, you know, all around just trying to, like, basically screw over the other, you know, Milsim out of members by telling them, hey, leave this one and then come join me, you know, it's not really like, at that point, it's not like, hey, I'm just in for more action, it's like, hey, I'm in here literally using you guys to basically spoon feed me for my own personal game, if that makes sense, so, I, I guess that's s- my take on that, but, yeah. I can I see have, it, I, wait, I, I can see it a, on, okay. hang on. I can see it on the very young in in incoming personnel, but anyone that's at least an NCO or above, they're staying unless oh, they yeah. can show, unless they can show some real proof that they're gonna they're gonna get their own unit, they get to run it, and you won't have anything else to say. But anyone that's on, on any military level, private to specialist, they are the most vulnerable on that level. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, you, that's, that's I guess, to add on to your point, like, like I'm saying, I was getting, like, a bunch of, like, sergeants and, you know, like, NCOs and, and, like, officers that were basically, like, messaging us back going, like, this guy's really trying to do this? Like, just saying he's trying to do this, so just keep a, a head out for that. Like, there's a bit of a difference, but obviously, you know, it'll be, like, your fresh guys who are the ones that'll fall for it over, you know, your... I guess, like, day one. Your veterans. And, you know, over the Milsims. Yeah, you're veterans. So, you know? I, yeah. I, I also noticed that people like that, uh, when the casual players start to leave, they tend to leave with them because the Milsim community, I think, in whole, uh, has lots of respect for one another. And eventually people like that uh, gets weeded out of the community as a whole. And I've noticed that the longer, uh, you know, when Wildlands got to its age... Um, you know, we started seeing a lot less of that. You know, again with Breakpoint, we started seeing a lot less of that as the as the game aged, because those people tend to not stay around at all to begin with. Uh, so I think that's something that is more of an issue when a game first comes out. It's hot. 
people want to play it. You get all these different people. Uh, but I've noticed that when the casuals and whatever starts to leave and they go on to the newer games that are coming out and you're left with the more dedicated Milsim, you tend to have a very similar uh, attitude and mindset amongst the community as a whole. And we start seeing less of that as time goes on, uh, where we start seeing the whole backdoor <clears throat> recruiting. So I might have a different opinion to the rest of them. Uh, for me, with being in multiple Milsims, it's... Uh... I wasn't a fan of that. If you joined a Milsim, it was there because you were wanting to, again, you were wanting to be there. Um, and usually, again, everybody has their lives outside of Milsim. Everyone, you know, so typically a schedule is usually set about when things go on. Um, I've had too many guys who are in multiple Milsims. Hey, welcome to the chat, Delta. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> um, Oh, we can. Yeah, I think we can hear muffled. Delta finally. It's muffly, but yeah. But um, if you're there in a Milsim, we obviously Milsims want you to be dedicated to theirs, uh, and that's kind of where it falls into. Does that mean we don't respect other Milsims that they want to be a part of? No, that's not what it means at all. We respect those guys. Um, we absolutely. I'm pretty sure I can say this for most of every Milsim out there. We absolutely love. Uh, other milsims because they're again they're people that are kind of like-minded to us but with me if you come into my milsim and then you sit there and say oh well i also want to be a part of this one um that kind of frustrates me because now you're starting to deal with like attendance wise obviously we want guys to be active we want guys to be there whenever we go on ops and do stuff we want to play with these guys and if you're off with another Milsim, whenever we sit there and say, hey, today's the day that we're going to, you know, do this, uh, or we have it set for this day, and you're like, oh, well, I can't make it because I'm doing this with others from Milsim, obviously it's going to be a little bit of a, you know, punch to the gut, uh, at least for me. And maybe that's, again, just me. Hopefully it's, uh, well, I say hopefully. Maybe it is. And if it's not, then, I mean, it's, it's, it is what it is. Uh, I, I don't share that sentiment that the rest of them seem to have. I don't mind if other Milsons want to come in and, you know, like, hey, you know, we want to we wanna operate together and whatnot, but if I have a guy who's a part of, like, U.S., uh, some U.S. SOCOM server or even in, like, Doc server or uh, maybe even Primes, sit there and go, like, yeah, I'm also a part of these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to straight up ask him, why aren't you there? I mean, we have no problem with linking up with you guys and doing ops together, but why are you trying to attend both? That makes sense. Do we have Delta? Can we hear you this time? Uh, you tell me. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we got you. yeah, finally. So, anything you want to add? I've lost him again. <laughs> we had him for a moment, and he went. No, he's gone. Right, gone okay, gone I, want to move, I want to move on to my final question. So, and I think this one's quite important. Um, obviously, we know that Ubisoft is a company that is there for its number one purpose is to make money. You know, they have shareholders and all the rest of it, and they want to make money. I understand that, and I think everyone understands that. But at the same time, they have to provide decent entertainment for us to put our money into. Now, obviously, with the creation of Milsims and people that play Milsims, they obviously believe that that entertainment value is there, otherwise they wouldn't bother. But this gets me into a point where, obviously, being a YouTuber, I get a lot of different opinions. You get a lot of people, you know, you hear a lot of comments, and I like reading people's comments from casual people that say things like, um, you know, I want to see more film crossovers i want to see zombies i want to see stuff like this and then you'll get more maybe kind of what i call the hardcore player who just wants more options just give us options for this 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 um and then you know you might get more milsim players that want more camos in the game and more weapons and things like that I'm not saying that none of those can't break into each other because of course they can but what what I want to ask you is, do you think that Ubisoft should be paying more attention to one of these groups than another? So, for example, should they be paying more attention to the Milsim community 
because they are the ones that are possibly keeping this game alive and played a lot longer than maybe your average kind of casual player. Do you think they should be putting that effort in to listen to Mill Sims, what they want, the type of things that they want in the game? Um, and how should they go about kind of utilizing that and doing that? Actually, I'd like I to actually... hear Doc's, I'd like to kind of hear Doc's answer on this one because he's got a lot of decent philosophy on that that we've talked about. Actually, to be honest, uh, it was funny because uh, I was I actually saw something in the news just a few hours ago, um, and I think that this would be very important. So I think that you should always focus on the group that is really supporting the game and learn how to build upon that in ways that can make it um, truly one of its own, but to the point that outsiders can't ignore it anymore. Let's take Elden Ring, for example. FromSoft has done a really good job of catering to its fan base, but also looked into other ways that how can we make this game better and more accessible to other people. In doing so, Elden Ring, and I'm saying this, it's from Young Yeah, a uh, shout out to him. Elden Ring was so successful that it outsold Call of Duty in just two months. Think about that. So instead of all these trend chasing that Ubisoft is trying to do, they should focus on what makes ghost recon good to this community build upon that make it so that the community the community really is one of its own but figure out how to still make it accessible to other people without compromising its core values and it gets to the point where a lot of us are so strong we're so you know we're having such a good time outsiders cannot ignore it anymore to the point that you know you have people maybe playing Battlefield, they want more of a Milsim experience, or Call of Duty, want more of that Milsim experience, want more of that, uh, you know, replayability. They look over, they go, I'm going to check that out. And now all of a sudden, you have this very passionate community that is so big, so dedicated, that's so consistently there. It's not a game like Call of Duty where it dies out in a year or something like that, and they always have to constantly pump out game after game. This is something that will be so strong that the moment they drop the next Ghost Recon, It'll, like they just have this huge dedicated fan base. They'll be there day one to support it, and I think that they they need to focus on that and build upon that to the best of their abilities instead of trying to chase trends and trying to grab short term success. Oh, that's a really good point. Um, who anyone else want to come in on that? Um, I have a little bit of to speak on that. Um, I think that Ubisoft should folk i'm not saying that they should focus on other like groups of like their um people who play the game but i think they should focus um more on the milsim community as um one i feel like you know ghost recon they've always kind of been more arcadey which is fine which i love and sometimes it's fun to not play milsim like in in that style but i still feel like it's important to like listen to the Milsom community because like kind of like you said, um, they're sometimes the people who keep the game alive and sometimes are the people who can have a good legacy on that game. Oh, hello, Delta. What's up, Delta? Oh, Delta, can you mute? Oh, I just got some feedback oh, there, buddy. Please, please, oh, yeah, please mute. Time we get them, and now we got to tell them to mute. (laughs) (laughs) I do want to say this to uh, Raccoon's thing as well. Um, It's not like that we aren't trying to make our voices heard. I understand Milsom is a bit of a controversy, but I'm not trying to interject you here. I just want to make sure that this is pointed out. We have been trying to speak out about what you know what we would like to see in, in these games to actually help, kind of fill that niche that people obviously want to play. We buy these games to deal, to like fill that niche. Um, the original Ghost Recons were more of a military shooter, a um, little less arcadey than nowadays. And we're just... We don't want to take away anybody else's fun. We don't want to take away anybody else's uh, good time. But we're... We put our stuff in, and people are sitting there going, like, well, you're just trying to be too serious. You're just trying to make it something that you're, you're trying to pretend to be something you're not. I can't tell you how many times I've had that comment. And it's, yep. in my opinion, it's like, this is a military shooter. How, how are we pretending to, you're pretending to be something you're not by partaking in this game as well. Why well, is some, it that my voice can't be heard? 
some people like to, and, and I'm and I'm referencing to a lot of the military personnel. Some people probably got out of the real military because of either time, injury, or whatever other reason. And this is their other way of saying, hey, I can get back into the military. I don't have to go do PT, but I can still have fun doing this. Some people really enjoyed being in the military for said reasons. They might not have had... They might not have had a combat position either, so this is their combat position. I'd like to hear Doc's. Whenever you just finished that statement, I really want to hear because Doc has said something similar whenever we were discussing something. He's just I, do want, I do want to mention. I do want to mention though that having player choice and how they want to set up the game is very important. I feel like casual players should have. A more casual experience that they want, but then they you know give us the ability for ha- us to have those more realistic mills in terms. I think Breakpoint did a really good job of finding a good way to give more options to players depending on what you play and how your play style is. And I think that even though yes, we 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 as a Milsom community wanted to see a lot uh, for the Milsom community, I still think that's very important that they don't forget and abandon the more casual community as well, even though they're short term maybe. If they want to have more of a Call of Duty run and gun experience, I feel like there should be room for that as well. And we as a Milsom unit can decide what works best for us as well. So it's, you know, I, I don't want it to be just one sided. So if people feel like we're speaking up, that's shouting out, that's like shrouding out their voices. In my opinion, I think that having the ability to change settings to make it so that if you want a specific play style, if you want a specific way the game's gonna fight you of uh, that that can happen so that everyone could find their own enjoyment and their own strides uh, I, in the game as well I, I totally agree with you on that and i think my, to be honest i think most people would agree with you on that even if you play in a meal sim style all the time i think most people will recognize that for a game to be supported long term it needs to sell so you need to be able to make sure that different types of people will play that game buy it you know, and put money into it. Um, I think, as you just said, the number one, we've said this multiple times on videos, podcasts, as long as you put the settings in there so you can, you know, if you want full HUD on um, and play it very casually, then you can. But just make sure that all the, you know, whatever game, the new game, whatever it is, just make sure that you always have those options to make sure whatever it is you have turned on for a casual fan, that you can also turn them off so you can go more hardcore, mill sim, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if we've got Doc. Is Doc is Doc there or is he? I'm not sure because he's not. Oh, he is there. I can't hear him. Are you there, Doc? No, I can't hear Doc. So I'm yeah, not... I've, oh, he's... I've been here, man. Oh, hey, dude. So he did you want to? Did got you some feedback too, dude? Yeah, Del, you got shocking feedback. Um, uh, Doc, did you want to come in from what Tyrant was saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've been trying to answer like almost three questions up to this point. Um, so some sweeping generalities, right? Um, so getting down to the base issue that we have in terms of our community being represented is the only voice that gets heard in a room is the loudest voice or the ones that are speaking the same thing more often. From from the fact that you know I'm either a moderator or an admin for basically the entirety of the Milsim community as a whole, um, I can vouch that as, you know, as a sweeping majority, we're only about 75, maybe just shy of 10,000 members deep. We're not a very large community, and we're an extremely niche corner of what you would consider to be tactical gameplay. You know, we all have our own sweeping generalizations on how we want to play and all the renditions, but realistically... And having worked with 12 different countries, like, on ground myself, like, we all speak the same language. Like, tactics are universal, because it's it's an applied measure on combat operations. We just all have our slightly different rendition on doing it. But, more specific to the point, um, because we're not in the millions, we're not, like, a huge dominating community within what would be considered a ghost recon standpoint we don't have an extremely large voice on getting heard 
for the stuff that we want. Yes, we get stuff eventually just because, you know, eventually the casual players kind of catch on to the fact that, you know, we these are good things to have. But, like, um, when it comes to some of the sweeping generalities of wanting, like, for example, content within the game, there, Ubisoft is only going to hear what the majority of people are saying. And the majority of people are the casual players that usually just play this just to run some bases, do some missions, and then, you know, do their thing. And not the dedicated hardcore Milson players that sit here and get on every day and do this at, at a team level. So it's just because we're not a large enough community to get fairly, like, equally represented, uh, you know, when compared to the casual community that we get our fair measure of input. Um, and then going into some of the other, you know, previous questions, just to kind of close everything up on my end. Um, the complexity of a milsim and what brings it its uniqueness factor is only going to be represented by the experience, creativity, and dedication of those that make it. Um, and so when we go into the effort of making these units and building these, like we, we have to build all of this stuff by hand. And so when somebody just comes in and is like, oh, cool, I like that idea. I'm just going to take it for myself, copy and paste it, maybe change a few things in it, and then make something very similar or like almost identical and then take all of your members away from you or steal your idea. It's disrespectful. We don't like that. It's not the fact that we don't mind our documents being taken because some of us love sharing them. It's the fact that we put the time and effort into creating these processes, creating these organizations, that it almost just feels like a slap in the face every time somebody wants to take what, you know, what contribution we've made to the community. Um, and so, yeah, there's a little bit of competition. There's a little bit of safeguarding. Um, but I think ultimately we all speak the same language. We're all driving for the same purpose. And we all have a similar respect for each other on the context that what makes us unique are the experiences of the, of the members that we have and the people that create what our group is. And that's what we want to hold on to. We want to hold on to, like, for example, the guys that I've been friends with and a couple of them that I've gone down range with for years, half a decade, that, like, w you know, we get together, and that's just us. Like, we're buddies. You know, we're homies. We would we would take this into real life and go down range with each other just because of how tight-knit and how close we are. That's what we want. That's what all of us want when we create these units, and, you know, and create these philosophies. Um, and that's all we want is to just get represented and put ourselves out in the community as our own measure of force, our own community that we want to build within this grand philosophy that we're trying to expand, but it's because it's so niche and so specific from a very vast generalization of what everybody else thinks that this game should be that it's not going to get us as well represented. It's never going to. Realistically, it's never going to. But all we can do is continue to try, and that's that's all we we strive for, pretty much every day. I think that's a really excellent message that you just said then, and a nice kind of closing thing. Does anyone else like to come in with any final thoughts, or someone who hasn't spoken for a while, or anything from anything that we've covered, or any little points that you'd like to raise that we haven't brought up? I'll let uh, these guys go ahead and say their piece. I do want to say this really quick, and I kind of want to address this to the more casual base uh, to kind of help alleviate any doubt, to kind of help alleviate any, like, maybe animosity. We aren't saying we don't want you guys to be here in this game. It's a game. It's fun. We all love this series. But we also ask that you please don't shut this out. It, again, what Doc said is 110% true. We build everything by hand. Our operations, our, our Discord, our very foundation may be laid out for us, but to make the building, you still have to get the bricks, you still have to make the plans, you still have to do all of these things just to make it work. 
it's a big process and we take we do take a lot of pride in it um and we're only so soft spoken uh about these sort of things because again we are we kind of as much as i really hate to say it we are a bit of the redheaded stepchild of the game it's a bit of a tragedy or a travesty and tragedy at the same time um but it's I can't tell you how many times I've had people sit there and, you know, say, oh, well, you're just trying to be something you're not. You're just trying to, you know, catch glory where you don't deserve it or something like that. We're not here to try to commit anything like Stolen Valor. We're here to enjoy a game in a way that we wanted to enjoy it. Or for some of us, go back to a lifestyle that we couldn't be a part of or even be in a part of, like, just get a semblance of that lifestyle that we couldn't, you know, be a part of. There are some guys that I've talked to who have thanked me for the time and, you know, letting them in and operating with us and having fun and kind of like going that side of things because they couldn't get in due to medical reasons. Uh, I've had veterans who have said thank you for, you know, helping them kind of go back into that feel, that vibe, kind of like what Adup said. We're... We don't want anyone to, like, say, oh, this is far too hard. This is far too much. In some cases, if that's the case, then yes, it's not for you. But we are very, absolutely welcoming. The majority of milsims out there, I know there are some bad eggs. There's bad eggs everywhere. But the majority of the milsim community will happily welcome you with open arms, no matter what your level of gameplay and we will gladly absolutely gladly take time out of our day to kind of i don't want to say indoctrinate because that's not really the right term it's the right term but it just sounds so mold you I think. horrible yeah it's not even mold you we want to show you and give you these experiences so that way maybe you can come into this in another light Again, I used to play tactically, but it was never Milsim-like. And then I thought, well, I mean, I already play tactically. Milsim seems kind of cool and something that I want to be a part of. And again, I was scared uh, to come in. It was, it was, it definitely is kind of serious business on some points. But that's again because we build it all. We have a lot of pride for this thing that we have built, and for the guys there who have helped us build it. Please. Don't think that we're trying to, like, exclude anybody. We're not. We're trying to include you. We want more people to experience this, to see our world of this. So that way you know, look, it's it's fun. Uh, maybe even if it isn't for you, there's still some level of fun of, you know, going in with a team on a hard mission and coming out of that mission unscathed and doing the absolute best to just dominate whatever that objective was it's even it's even fun to have something mess up and then you have to go an entirely different direction just to still complete your mission it's again i can't say anything more than just give it a try uh again most of us here will happily welcome you all right well let's try and see what deflect um has to say before we call it a a show so one thing I always wanted to see from Ubisoft is I want to see them bring out the next game, uh, have it with its DLC, its storyline. And once when the game kind of wraps itself up uh, when it comes to like story and content, um, and again, at that point, the majority of the casual pe players would have left anyway, um, drop a whole tool set you know open up the game uh or let us open up the game a bit i'll let us have like you know i won't say like an extensive map editor but maybe like edit a few things create our own missions um create you know again nothing too crazy again it has to still work with the council i still believe that you know even though a pc player i still believe uh the councils do have the right of existence and i do respect that so make sure that's something that councils could still handle too but be able to really have these milsom communities then be able to kind of go in with our toolboxes and create our own unique experiences so that the game will still have its life even after uh, you know the last closing of the DLC storyline uh, finally comes to an end so that, you know, hey, we don't have to worry about 
adding more story to this, there's a community that will just do the work for us now. Now we can focus on doing other things with the uh, making the next game while the Milsom community could keep their end going and be able to keep the uh, the player base afloat as well. Um, I know, again, we you know it's probably too late to even ask for that for Breakpoint, but if they gave us the ability for us to really... You know, create more, uh, create more of a dynamic mission. Be able to, you know, know, uh, place certain enemies or have certain enemy types uh, in certain locations, and then just run that mission or like set up certain objectives, and have it really be more custom to what we wanted, we want to have as a uh, unit wise or as a as an op wise. I think would have just drastically increased the longevity. Again, you know, we look to Arma. You know, Arma, you can do that. That game's over ten years old now. It is still kicking, like no tomorrow. And they've even dropped DLC ten years later. You know, we had the Vietnam DLC. We had a uh, you know a, a more Iraq or Afghanistan DLC, and people will still buy them because there's still a community there for it. So it's it's still it's like as long as you, as long as you could drop some tools for the community to keep itself alive with, there that's still another. That's still a healthy, active community that you could probably, you know, sell some skins to later on down the road if you really wanted to. You know, so that's still a monetization route that, that could still be explored, again, within reason, uh, so that we can have uh, a very healthy community. Because I think one of the biggest issues, especially as, you know, as a unit leader, is, you know, you play Breakpoint. And if we if we played very consistently almost every day within three to four months, I think all of us have experienced it where the unit gets burnt out. We've all experienced. I've seen I've seen my units die over and over again after build a whole new unit from the ground up because majority of the active players just get burnt out. You can only do the yeah, same thing I, I so can see what you're times. saying. You need new content to keep the game so interesting. If, but yeah. if they gave me the tools for me to create new content, create new missions, create new scenarios outside of what the base game could have provided, including with all its DLC. I think that I could have kept these communities running. Heck, I probably, probably would still even have a community today to work with. So it's very important. You know, Again, you don't want to do it on day one, but you know, at the end of the game's life cycle, open up the game for, again, the, the, the dedicated, you know, Nilsom community. Okay. All right, let's... let's, Any- let's... Any Let's other go quick, over to quick final dark points? side, bro. I think Dark's. that's it. I think I think without us going into hours and hours of debate and discussion, because honestly, this is this is something that, uh, you know, the a good majority of us, you know, um, like Tyrant, myself, uh, Prime, I think we could talk about this for literal hours. Well, we can we, we can do this again. You know, there's no reason why we yeah. can't do this again. Yeah, one hundred percent. Different set of questions, scenarios, things like that. Um, yeah, but uh, what, I, what I'm saying is, so we don't start pushing into that complexity, and we don't start kind of like breaking down the nitty gritty behind it. Um, to you know, for the sake of the podcast, I, well, I, I feel like I'd quite like to do um, a podcast later on because I, I'm going to be making a, another video follow up on where we're doing the next game stuff. Um, on a possible map editor, stuff like that. And I want to go into some detail about what it should be on there. And I think that could be huge. Could be an interesting one to get some Milsim guys in on that because obviously that could revolutionize a game if you could create your own scenarios, bases, objectives, and all the rest of it. So we'll definitely look to do that um, down the line um, shortly. So um, keep an eye out for that. But I'd personally just like to say to everybody on tonight, considering we probably had the most amount of people who are active speakers on a podcast ever, I believe, um, rather than just, you know, audience coming up and speaking um, in general terms, it's um, it's actually gone really well. Like no one really spoke over each other. And I know I kind of said this earlier, but I want to say a big thank you to absolutely everybody that was on. I really, really do appreciate it. And obviously to uh, eight up for providing all of the background stuff and um, doing his usual intro. But like for everyone on the Mill Sims who came in um, to take part in this, uh, it was just, it went really well. And I've been really enjoyed listening to every single person here. So for me, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. 
And uh, hopefully you might, people might listen to this and you might get a few people uh, reaching out and uh, maybe, you know, looking to join a Milsim, for example. But um, On behalf of the Milsim community to you, Andy, and I think I speak for everybody here, thank you for actually letting us be here to actually have our voices be heard. Because it's yeah, not you a lot. 100%. No, that, and that's cool. Like I said before, this is this is about the community. It's all parts of the community, and the Milsim community is a huge part of the community. I know Doc was saying it's a, you know maybe only up to about ten thousand people, but you know we don't know how many people are actively playing this game at the moment. It only but might only be twenty five thousand people, and so suddenly ten thousand people is a huge number in terms of people that are playing it concurrently and are playing it every day or all the time. So it's it's important that we're listening to people um, from Milsims and and you know the people from Milsims that I've spoken to. Obviously, quite a few of you are uh, admins and and the JTF guys who I've spoken to. Uh, everyone so far has been so nice, and you know and yet from a, a, as an outsider's perspective, not so much recently, but maybe beforehand, I used to get like an opinion when you used to hear people talking about it that. It was a bit toxic and stuff like that. I've not found that at all. Um, I really haven't. Like every single person that's been on here tonight has just been, you know, everyone's let each other speak and, and, and everyone's had something really interesting to say and given me a really good insight into to what Milsim is and hopefully other people too. So um, I really, really appreciate um, the feedback everyone's given and, uh, and thanks for your kind words, Tyrant. I appreciate it. Um, so as I'm pretty much done. Um, I just want to say one more thing, and, and um, it, it, anyone who's got Milsims on here or anything like that, we do have a survey out, and I know I've been banging on about the survey to the point where people are probably like, well, shut up, but it is so, so important that we could try and get as many Ghost Recon, and especially as so much of it is catered to the Milsim hardcore kind of community as many people as possible to fill that survey out. I'm going to put it in the link in the description below. Please pass this on because we are giving the results to Ubisoft. So, you know, as many people as we can get, that would be awesome. But, um, Grandpa, do you want to take us out? All right. Well, I'd like to thank um, all of the task force slash Milsims that are, that were, are, that are in here today. Uh, JTF21, I know you guys are out there. Uh, Task Force Red Arrow, Task Force 104. Uh, defect with your group of the 248th and the 37th NSWG. Most likely you can find uh, all of these either on social media or in the Ghost Recon server. Um, we're there. All you got to do is just come find us as far as a team. Um, as far as the podcast, this has been a Bullet Catcher Gaming Podcast. Join us next time for another exciting episode. Join us on Discord. The Discord info is in the description. Comment, like, subscribe. Signing off. <laughs>